Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, this is the Hajir Show, of course. And Hajir and I are both so thankful for everyone who watches, uh, shares our videos, comments, and participates with us every week. Uh, if you are new to the show, just know that the Hajir Show has been around for a long time. And what we do is we take incredible people, we give them a platform here on the show to tell us about their lives and all the different ways that they're helping in their community. So today we have the incredible Tom Pichy. Tom is um, a world traveler. He is um, a drummer. He is into a lot of different things, and he's also an author. And you're going to recognize him in particular because he helped our very own Hajir write her book through Triumph and Tragedy. So, Tom, thank you so much. I know you're very busy, and I know you're calling from upstate New York all the way up there, but we appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Heather, and I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I've got my copy ready, too. So. <laughs> We're ready to go. This will be the okay. first meeting of the Hajir El Sheikh fan club. Excellent. All right. I'll. I would like the. I would like a co-title of uh, president. But I let's just plug the book super quick. This is available on Amazon. Um, tell people where we can get this book in particular, and then uh, Hajir can tell us a little bit about the proceeds of the book too. Yes, certainly. Uh, if you just go on Amazon, which everybody must know by now, unless you've been hiding under a rock. <laughs> and uh, if you put in Hajir's name, Hajir El Sheikh, or my name, Tom Pishi, either one, it comes up and it's right there and you just click on it and you can buy either the uh, electronic version, which is relatively inexpensive, or you can get a hard copy for yourself. Excellent, excellent. So I know that um, a lot of people have curiosity specifically about this book. So before we get into everything that that is your life, all of the incredible things you've done, all of the multifaceted things that make up who you are, let's talk about this process. So how did you and Hajir come to meet and come to collaborate on actually writing the book? It's actually very interesting because we, we discovered online, uh, she did, a mutual friend of mine who happens to live in France and is English. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was discussing writing with Hajir and he, Hajir said, well, I know somebody that's not too far from you who might be able to help you. And, and away we went. Uh, so that's a, a really unusual worldwide tale there that went from uh, Mechanicsburg to uh, the shore of France to outside of London, <laughs> England, to hear. And uh, it, it came about that way. And, and we got together on the phone for a number of things. And then we met in person several times. And uh, I will say, and I, I promise not to embarrass her too much, but <laughs> I was captivated as everybody else was with, you know, a hundred years of life that was crammed into basically 35 or 40. And uh, as we got into the more amazing parts of what occurred both before and after she arrived in the United States, uh, it wasn't always easy. It, uh, her reminiscing, uh, I'm sure caused some pain and I had to pull it out of her often. And uh, so we could find out, well, just what belonged in words and she had written a lot down and we, we, we used most of that. And, and then we embellished it a little bit with, with the truth because quite honestly, she was way too humble. And uh, I had to pull it out. And, you know, to, to talk about people dying, to talk about friends dying, to talk about torture, uh, these are very difficult su subjects. And, and the only way we can write about it is if we pull it out and put it out there on the table and this is what happened. And hopefully I was successful in doing that. And, uh, and I discovered this wonderful woman who I, you know, I'm just uh, totally amazed with. Is that how you remember it too? Because I mean, as a reader reading it, 
it's like arresting, like you like pause and you're super still while you're reading certain parts of it. And it's overwhelming. It's, it's incredible. So, I mean, what was it like to actually, I can imagine that it would be hard to talk about, but also, yes, I think you're right. Hajir is very humble and she might not want to elaborate on these things that honestly, they're just incredible. So, I mean, was it slow? Was it fast? Was it all at once? What do you guys remember? It was very slow and, and there was resistance. Uh, and some of it, I still don't think we, we went into enough. Uh, yeah. Things like the, uh, the difficulty that a uh, refugee faces when they get uh, torn apart in a third location. Uh, her times in Cairo were probably as difficult as the times in Khartoum being tortured. Uh, it, it really, to put all this together and realize what these people go through uh, gives you a completely different perspective on uh, just how difficult and how, to be honest, I hate to use the word great over and over, but how great a person has to be to go through all this and, uh, and still succeed. But, uh, you know, it, 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 it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy in Khartoum. That's why she left. And it wasn't easy in the transitional stage until she was able to arrange passage to the United States. So, so you know. this is the Tom Bishi time, not the Hajir time. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, okay, I'm I'm gonna say, <laughs> I'm gonna say, you know, the best thing happened with this whole whole experience and process is getting to know you getting to know Tom as the human, as the beautiful soul that he is, and to gain a close friend. And I can truly call him like mentor, friend, everything. And my feeling towards you is not, will never be neutral. I love you. I can't hide it. So there is no, um, we can say the whole, the whole writing uh, was like, I wrote a lot at the beginning and, when he looked at it and read it, he's like, okay, this area, I can feel you're not doing the good job, a good job here. You need to talk, <laughs> you need to add. So he, he's good. That, that shows how great of not just a person, uh, but a writer he is and with his experience. You know, he wrote four novels. Uh, he helped many people, um, you know, with their books and we're going to have him talk about that. But he traveled like he traveled the world and we can't say the whole world, but even if you don't physically travel, he read, he exposed himself to the truth. He got to know different cultures and, and you know, traveling is anti-dot for ignorance. And Tom is truly not an ignorant person. He think he come to a conclusion on his own after he does his own research. And, you know, it, it, it amazed me how when I said, I was born in Tandalti, which is a small village in Sudan. The next day, got an email from him with how many people live there, where is that place in map, information that I didn't know myself. So, you know, that just speaks volume about how uh, meticulous his research is and everything that he do in a daily basis. So I I'm going to shut up because I can talk about you until the end of life. And I just love you and I'm honored to have met you and have this book with you and to just have you in my life in general. So. Heather, if you don't mind, perhaps before we move on to some of the background and the different things I've done over my rather long life, which I don't mind telling anybody, I'll be 75 soon. Uh, but. I would like to talk about the present for a moment and uh, get that up front. Well, if anybody's on, they can really hear something that I think is important. Uh, we talk about what we've gone through, all of us, this past 18 months. And uh, it's really an interesting thing. And the various politicians will all claim that they've done a wonderful job. And to which we've survived it. I'm not sure we wouldn't have survived it with or without the politicians, but I certainly don't accept that they did a wonderful job because something occurred 
that it's going to be probably a couple of years before we start seeing something called the lower rate of average life. Uh, as over 200 years in the United States, every year they tell us what the average life expectancy is, you know, 80 for a woman, 79 for a man. And uh, it's been going up consistently every year for 200 years because people, frankly, uh, are taking better care of themselves and medical science has proceeded uh, to obliterate various diseases and is getting closer and closer to the ones that are still shortening our lives. However, that being said, in February and March of 2020, we were all faced with this tragic pandemic. And I've got to tell you that I think some people panicked and did some things that were overreactions that really in the long run are going to hurt us. And it's going to be a while before we even realize it at a time when the hospitals were overwhelmed with sick people, instead of finding more people to come in and take care of them and other places to put hospitals, they put a stop to the entire medical system. And that 18 months now that the medical system was put on pause is gonna come back to haunt us. And unfortunately, I'm one of those that already knows what he's talking about. I had a colonoscopy scheduled for March of 2020. Since turning 40, I've had a colonoscopy every four years regularly, never missed it. So I've had like eight or nine up until then. And the reason was very simple. My mother died at 41 of colon cancer, basically. Last year, it was canceled. It took until three, three and a half weeks ago to get put back on the schedule. And actually, it took a little work to get that. And I had to jump through a lot of hoops, but I had it done. And, and to make a point, Basically, uh, we're still going through all of the precautions for COVID, which I totally agree with. And uh, my daughter, uh, who basically likes to mother me, thank you, both of them. And uh, she had taken me to the colonoscopy. And of course, a big sign on the door, no one can enter but the patient. So off she goes, they're gonna call her when I'm ready to be picked up. Well, of course, the surgeon immediately found a problem and uh, picked up the phone and called my daughter. So when I woke up from the procedure, there stands my daughter who isn't allowed in the building, but is now standing next to my bed. <laughs> Okay, what's going on? <laughs> yes, I was diagnosed immediately with colon cancer and told that it had been around for a couple of years and it grown fairly well, if you can use that term, and that something had to be done immediately. So over the last three weeks, I've been poked, prodded, had every test in the world. And on Wednesday morning at 7.30, uh, I will have a rather serious cancer surgery performed in the hopes that they can get it all out. Uh, I do seem to be pretty lucky. Uh, they've done all the checks and the tests and uh, it's isolated in one area. It has not grown to any other primary organs at this time. So hopefully uh, after Wednesday, I'll find out a, just how, what they found and, and we'll go on from there for life. But the, the important thing is that, uh, you know, we've all had a hiccup these last 15, 16, 18 months. 
and everybody's got to be aware that you know you have to you're your primary care physician yourself you have to know your own body and if something has been put off whether it's having your heart checked or or getting a test that you normally have done and it's been put off uh, it's time to reconsider just what you're going through and get back in charge of things. And uh, if you have to ruffle some feathers to get it done, get it done. And, and furthermore, the uh, vaccination thing, it, yeah, we've all had it, most of us. And it wasn't, for me, it was no worse than my normal annual flu shot. And it's inconceivable to me, and I've got it in my own family. Some people have refused to have it, and uh, to me, it's just ridiculous. If you haven't been vaccinated yet, go do it. All right, Heather, what do you want to know? <laughs> well, let's let's talk about that a little bit because I think that that's true. Because I think um, when people are thinking about the vaccine, if they're hesitant at all, first of all, Hajir and I had a spectacular show with an epidemiologist, and she breaks down every single question, every frequently asked question, every possible concern, and she just laid it bare. So that's a fabulous show. Even if you just watch the middle chunk where she talks about the the vaccine, but. They don't think about stuff like that too, where there are people like Tom who are sitting here with a diagnosis and they're in between a diagnosis and a surgery. And it's important that we're keeping everybody safe and, we're, and it's important that we're keeping uh, you know, our healthcare providers safe. And it's incredibly short-sighted to think that there is just uh, people that are vaccinated and people that aren't. There's this whole world in between that we need to actually be thinking about bigger than ourselves. That's absolutely true. And the scarier part is that some of these people that haven't been vaccinated are even healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. I applaud the Supreme Court that ruling in favor of the hospital in uh, Texas. I absolutely uh, applaud that. Uh, they had uh, basically told all their workers, you will be vaccinated. And 70 or 80 of them refused and they were fired. Mm -hmm. And they took it in, in an urgent case to the Supreme Court. And it was ruled that the hospital acted in good faith and that it was within their right to demand that of their employees. If you didn't want to work there, you didn't have to. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it uh, basically, I just, I just don't, uh, don't accept now. I mean, especially those that have waited this long. Uh, we now have literally hundreds of millions of people have had these things. And sure, there's been a couple people here and there that have had a reaction or whatever. And in some of these, uh, you know, I, I heard five people had this heart thing or whatever. Well, if, if you're talking in terms of almost a billion people, how many people would have, of those billion people would have had that heart thing anyway? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I haven't seen a single thing that, that would make me hesitate uh, from myself or my children or anybody else uh, getting it and let's get this thing over with. And an interesting point, uh, speaking of epidemiology, uh, as I said, I'm 75. Well, if you do the, or I will be, if you do the mathematics, that means that in the early 50s, I was in a Catholic elementary school that was part of the Salk vaccine uh, trial. And they came into our school and injected us all. And no, we weren't asked whether we wanted it or not. We had no choice. <laughs> and uh, a year later, it was announced that this uh, polio vaccine worked. A year later than that, Salk was getting the Nobel Prize in medicine. And you know, when I was a kid, I knew quite a few kids who had polio and either walked with a limp or didn't walk at all. And, you know, how many people know kids with polio now? I rest my case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Literally mm -hmm. obliterated an entire disease that was rampant. And all we had, yeah. In our area, we had a school district, actually, where Hajir lives. 
say that at the time for prom, they wanted people to be vaccinated and the adults and the everyone that was going to be chaperoning. People lost their damn minds. They could not handle it. And, and it was like, but you had to get your regular vaccine schedule to get into school anyway. Yeah. It, it's just, it's become so politicized. And I know you're in upstate New York. So what's the political climate up where you are in general? Well, <laughs> Upstate, it tends to be a little uh, anti-New York City and uh, mm -hmm. a little bit more anti-Cuomo. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we, we've often talked about Tsar Cuomo. Uh, but the, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, our percentage is high. Uh, we're, we're doing real well on that. And uh, certainly, uh, I would hope that everybody else would, too. Uh, you, you know, you just need to look at the st statistics and you can see across the South, the Bible Belt and some places in the Southwest. Uh, that's where they're holding out. And I'm afraid that that's going to be uh, pockets of disease that when the thing, whole thing should have been obliterated in one felt swoop, it, it, uh, it, it's going to hang on there. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, and, and you experienced COVID yourself, right? Pardon me? You experienced it yourself. Yes, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah, the, uh, they're, they're uh, definitely uh, one of my kids uh, refuses to get vaccinated. And, and a strange thing happened. Uh, after I got my first shot, the... We got together for a family gathering. It was a birthday party. And a couple of days later, I was sick. And I had it. And uh, it, you know, it's just, we were a bit premature having that birthday party. Mm -hmm. and, and, but fortunately, and my doctor tells me that it's because I had had the first shot that I had a very mild case and I really was only sick for a day or two. And then for a week it hung on and some of the things like the, the you've heard people talk about the metallic taste in their mouth, I definitely had that. And, uh, but that after a week I was fine. And, and now from that standpoint, I'm fine and you know, <laughs> It almost gets, I have to smile. The girl that gives COVID tests at the nearby clinic, her and I are becoming old friends because every <laughs> time I have a procedure, I have to get a new COVID test. Oh my God. So um, I mean, and you're older. getting your procedure on Wednesday. So you're going to have. I had a COVID test. On, it had to be done on uh, the second on Friday for the procedure on Wednesday. Yep. I had another COVID test and it was negative. <laughs> wow. And to just yeah. look at you with everything that is going recently in your life and you still carry that beautiful smile and a positive attitude and the spirit. This is so refreshing and inspiring. Tom, how do you, how do you manage to do that? I don't know if inspiring is the word. I'm not going to kid you. I was scared and I, <laughs> you know, I'm nervous now. I don't think scared is the word now, but but certainly uh, in what we haven't said is that uh, in 2017, I lost my wife of almost 50 years and uh, to cancer, pancreatic cancer. And uh, it was a real problem. So yeah, this became, this came on as quite a shock and uh, definitely uh, is a problem, but you know, we, we move on and we do what we have to do. And that's what I'm doing now. So I'm just glad. I think we've got some wonderful doctors and, uh, you know, I will see what happens. I'm told that I'll have some of the most uh, advanced robotic machinery working on me. Mm, so fancy. Be, wish, wish I could watch it, but, uh, <laughs> you, know, uh, but you know, perhaps that's, we beat the COVID to death, but uh, it, it really is quite a thing. And, and, you know, one of the things, if things can be simple, if you really let them go and let them be simple, they can mm -hmm. be simple. Now, we don't have to throw the ACLU under the bus. Okay, no, it would not be right to make a law that says everybody has to be vaccinated. But you know what? 
it's perfectly legal as the Supreme Court told that hospital in Texas, it would be perfectly legal for Major League Baseball to say, if you wanna to go to Yankee Stadium, you've gotta show your vaccination. If you wanna to go to an NBA basketball game, you gotta show your vaccination. If you wanna to go to a movie theater, you gotta show your vaccination. That would all be legal. And it's not stepping on anybody's toes. Yeah. So maybe, maybe these uh, NASCAR followers who won't get vaccinated, if they were told they couldn't get into the race without the vaccination, maybe we see the percentage, percentages get up to where they really need to be. Mm -hmm. So sometimes things are easier than they seem. So no, we don't have to start a war in Washington and pass a law that says everybody has to be vaccinated. But if everybody that holds a major meeting of thousands of people says, well, okay, we're, we're, the state of emergency is ended, we can get together with our thousands of people. But by the way, if you're gonna come into my stadium, you better show your vaccination card. Mm -hmm. So an interesting, an interesting side note, Heather, is that let's take it back to paper had a picture of fake vaccination cards. So, you know, there's a, always a yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, you know, when you were talking, I wanted to say uh, those fans, they were either get vaccinated or buy. It's they're, they're spending $20 to buy a fake oh, card. So. Yeah. But, um, let's talk about you. Let's let's go back to the beginning. Like, who is sure. Tom? OK, uh, basically, uh, I have two lives. I had a career in which uh, I was fortunate uh, for 20 years with one an electronics company. I did a lot of work with the government and with foreign governments and uh, had a lot of customers who were from all over the world, got to have a very diverse background and travel a little bit. And uh, basically uh, a lot of our customers uh, were uh, Muslim. Uh, so I was well exposed to that. Uh, did a lot of work with Aramco in Saudi Arabia and have some opinions that, that uh, don't need to be said today. But uh, it's not like I didn't study that and uh, didn't live it myself. So I. So what was I the time period when you're kind of traveling the world? What's that time period that you're doing that? Uh, well, uh, mostly the uh, 80s was the mm -hmm. height, the late 70s and 80s. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't travel all that much, but the doors were open and I got to go to quite a few places. Uh, uh, one of the few people you'll ever meet who has actually seen with his own eyes, Angel Falls in Venezuela. And wow. that was just before they... Uh, uh, shortly before they closed the country to Americans. Uh, it's quite a sight. It's only, you can only get to a, it's the highest falls in the world, the highest waterfall in the world. And you can only get there by mule train or plane. There's actually a concrete <laughs> runway there. And, uh, and, and it's, called, it's Kanema National Park in the, uh, where the estuary, uh, the beginning of the uh, Amazon basin starts in Venezuela. And uh, it was uh, quite a trip. And that wasn't for business, that was for pleasure. But an interesting side note, uh, when I told my wife I was bringing her to Venezuela, she says, well, is that safe? I said, well, of course it is. It's a safe country and everything. And, Excuse me. And the uh, my boss, who uh, was a who lived in uh, a little apartment complex in Washington D.C. that became very famous in the '70s, and lived next door to Dick Cheney. Uh, he uh, he had friends all over the world in various governments. So he, before I left, he said, well, you, I had talked to him. I told him my wife was a little apprehensive that we were really going pretty deep into the third world. And uh, he handed me a slip of paper with a phone number on it. He says, if you have any trouble,
call this phone and just tell them that Telmo told you to call. So I said, okay, I smiled. I said, who is it? And he says, just a friend of mine who happens to be president and uh, the president of Venezuela. So, you know, before we left, I had to tell Karen, I said, I got, well, I have this number here. So you were a little concerned. Don't worry about it. If we have any trouble, I have the private phone number of the president of Venezuela. <laughs> so that was fine. We never had to use it. And we, we had this wonderful vacation, went to Margarita Island, went to Canema National Park, went to all kinds of places. And uh, we got home and it was like a week later. She slams the morning paper down in front of me and says, does this mean what I think it means? And the headlines are, coup in Venezuela, president arrested. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I just you missed it. it. <laughs> you have a nice vacation. <laughs> Jer says you missed it. So there's my international <laughs> story. <laughs> so we while you're trying to talk about with you and I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so really. while you're traveling the world and while you're doing all of this it, have you even started to think about becoming an author yet have you already been involved in music yet was it overlapping or did you have uh, kind of chapters of your own life as you moved from thing to thing the music came first for everything okay uh, I started at a very young age my older brother was involved and in, uh, so I was literally as soon as I was old enough to hang onto a horn, and by the way, I'm not a drummer, I play brass. Okay, got uh, it. I'll forgive you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but the drummers are weird, brass are normal. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I, it, at a very young age, I got into what we call drum and bugle corps, which is a type of marching band. And uh, then we went on from there and uh, I was, uh, relatively well known and, and did that. I've done that consistently now for 65 years as a real avocation. And uh, unfortunately, a few times it came first instead of second. And, uh, but uh, really it's a, a love and a, and a way of life. And uh, uh, I got to travel everywhere. I've worked with groups in Germany and England and Japan. And uh, and, and of course, we uh, uh, have many groups here, although COVID has done its damage. We'll see what comes up as the phoenix tries to rise from the ashes. But mm -hmm. uh, my kids were involved. I was involved. I became an adjudicator. Uh, I was chief judge in New York. I was chief judge of one of the national associations and uh, had quite a history in that. And uh, in 2006, I was elected to the uh, World Drum Corps Hall of Fame. And I got some wow. other awards. So it was fun. Uh, it was different. Uh, I mostly worked with marching and uh, also judged and taught a lot of high school bands. Uh, particularly enjoyed working with a couple of high school bands that had Jair knows real well in the area. Uh, maybe Mechanicsburg and Cumberland Valley might be the uh, names. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I had a lot of fun with that, but I did have to raise a family and survive. So we got involved in the marketing and then the uh, uh, field of uh, electronics, which is which was pretty much mostly military. And uh, so I had some interesting things and, and some interesting background. Uh, one of uh, our, our gear wasn't quite so sophisticated that we had to worry about spies and that type of thing, but a lot of it was restricted who we could sell it to. Mm -hmm. And part of my job was to uh, screen customers to make sure that we weren't doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. and I, we had a standing joke. Uh, we, we had sold uh, before Libya uh, was taken over by Gaddafi and his boys. Uh, we had sold some very powerful radios to their embassy and to them. And then, of course, once uh, 
restrictions were put on and we couldn't could no longer deal with Libya. Well, they've got all this equipment of ours and of course the equipment, they don't know how to maintain it. So it broke down and they're looking for spare parts. Well, we had a standing joke about once a week, I would get an order for spare parts from Thailand, from Brussels, from <laughs> London, from wherever. And it would be the same Convenient. parts that they were trying to buy for, li for, for Libya. <laughs> And I'd say, Gaddafi's at it again and hold up the list. But that was part of my deal. And, it, you know, it's interesting how things kind of connect over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, things I had to watch out for was that some of our communications equipment was very well sought after. And one of the ones that were sought after for uh, were the paramilitary groups that had, had sprung up around the United States. Wow. If you don't know, there's more soldiers of fortune in the world, paid soldiers who fight only for money. Uh -huh. There's more soldiers of fortune in the world from Pennsylvania than any country in the world. <laughs> wow. What's second that about? Is, second is Minnesota, by the way. So I would get requests for radios or whatever from uh -huh. some interesting places in the United States and I'd have to scope them out and make a few phone calls to Washington and uh, no, we would just assume you didn't sell them. <laughs> but uh, those kinds of things happen. I yeah, can tell you they're... another story about marketing that was interesting. Mm -hmm. We Well, I have two and I'll then we can leave that aspect of my life. Uh, one was that we provided all the radios for Jacques Cousteau. Wow. All the ships. Yeah. I got a phone call one night and they were desperately trying to re get some emergency communications gear. Mm -hmm. It was the weekend that his son went missing. And wow. we, we had to fly gear to the Caribbean for the hunt for Jacques Cousteau's son, who was killed. Wow. So that was one that got interesting. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I had talked to his other son. I never did talk to him personally. But the other one was that it, we were building a, a military gear. Well, how do you build military gear? You build military gear by finding out what the military needs. Mm -hmm. So when we would come up with a new radio, we had contacts and we would say, you know, well, look, we'll ship you a demo and you try it and see how it works out. So I had this one major who uh, was quite a friendly guy and, and we got to know each other very well. And he was stationed in, in uh, one of the big bases in the, in the Carolinas. And come to find out, he heads the SAS, Special Assault Squad. So over the years, and it was a number of years, I had put in, sent him, of course, for the company, uh, thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars of test equipment, mm -hmm. which, he, which he would say, well, this worked, or this wasn't waterproof enough, or this was too cumbersome or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we would, our engineering department would react to that and, and deal with it. So finally, I went about almost a year I hadn't heard from him. And he had a lot of my equipment. Now, this is all on loan. These are demos, you try it. And then they send it back to us. So finally, uh, someone in the higher up than me said, you know, what's going on? you know, I, we need that equipment back. And so I'm making phone calls. So I, I call the guy and someone answers at the base. It was an army base. And I said, I need to speak to so-and-so, so-and-so. Nobody here by that name. I said, Ooh. I'm sorry. You know, and I had to go through the whole thing. So finally, after about five or 10 phone calls, I called someone I know at another three letter organization in Washington. 
<laughs> and, you know, I said, hey, look, I need some help. I've got to get some equipment back from the Army, and I can't get anything out of them. Do you guys have any idea what's going on? They said, well, who are you dealing with? And I told them. He says, look, here's the number of the base. Call back again and ask for this person and tell them I sent you. But call the number and the, I get another officer. And I said, you know, what is going on? I need my equipment back. He says, well, we're, we found your equipment and we will ship it back to you, it's all there. Well, okay, but where's so-and-so? I mean, I've been dealing with this guy for a number of years, not months. And he says, look, he says, this is confidential, but he says, you know, the Achilles Laurel. And you're not old enough, Heather, but there was a, the Arab terrorists took over a cruise ship in the Mediterranean. And they threw an American overboard in his wheelchair. That was the Achilles Laurel. And they had the whole ship held hostage. He says, well, Major so-and-so and his team were in Morocco running test uh, assaults to get ready to assault the Achilles Laurel and take out these terrorists. Wow. His helicopter went down and they were all killed. Oh, my gosh. You know, now that's probably still top secret information, but I didn't mention any names. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully now, since we're talking 40 years, you know, hopefully it's no longer a top secret. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, those are the things that go on in life and you don't even know about it till they happen. So I had some interesting yeah. things. Never made yeah, a million mean bucks, but I had an interesting time. Honestly, that's better than a million bucks. Having a life with adventure, having a life where you have experiences, where you can get random phone calls from Hajir and kind of have your life overlap in all these different ways. That's the best thing. And honestly, I think the theme throughout your life, throughout music, throughout everything else has been curiosity. So when you got into writing, was that something you did your whole life and then you just turned it into this new chapter? Or is it something that uh, you stumbled into completely and you had to learn uh, later in life? Uh, yes and no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stumbled into later in life, yes. Uh, learning, well, I, I owe it with the various uh, parts of drum corps and, and marching bands, uh, I had been involved with publicity and uh, for a number of years I was a PR man for one of the national organizations. So I was known as someone who could write and, and kind of leaned in that direction. So once we got to the point of full retirement uh, in 2007, uh, then it was, uh, you know, not a great leap uh, to, to, to try to write something myself. Mm -hmm. So that's where the four books came from. I've kind of stalled since then. I probably should get back to it. Uh, we do editing too, right? You edit yes. other people's books? That, that is how I got stalled. I, I met these other authors because of mm -hmm. helping each other, similar to Hajir. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got into editing. So that has become an, another obligation. And mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I don't do it for a lot of money. But, but I've got quantity. I'm over 200 novels that I've edited. Wow. I mean, so it must be interesting, at least to you, to get all of these different works. And I'm assuming that they're all different types of genres, different types Correct. of actual writing. Yeah, that's the trick of it. You know, and every mm -hmm. once in a while, you get one that, that's a real stinker. And, you know, <laughs> what do you do with it? Uh, it? But most of the time, it's interesting. It's just, uh, yeah, fortunately, I'm an avid reader. and uh, it's, uh, it's turned things over. And then with the, with the directions that my life took and losing Karen back when, uh, you know, the, my family will tell you that I live with my Kindle in front of me. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I have multiple Kindles. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I uh, you know, I read constantly and now I, I'm always editing. So I'm mm -hmm. even, to be honest with you, crashing through a huge book 
oh, somebody wrote a version of War and Peace. I, I, couldn't, <laughs> I opened it up. A, a novel is 120,000. If you, if you ever wanted to know, if you want to write the perfect novel, go for between 100 and 120,000 words. This book I'm doing now is 225,000 words. Oh my it's gosh. like three books running together in one. Mm -hmm. But wow. uh, it, it really- I is. remember you said that to me when we were starting. And I'm going to remind you, as soon as you get out of that surgery and you feel better, we have work to do, sir. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. <laughs> but you got to dig deep. Uh, I will. Oh, that, that's for you. You know how to get that out. Uh, so talk to <laughs> us about the books. Um, I know the, we, we're never going to have enough time to talk about your life. You have an amazing journey. You're an amazing person. And by the way, your friend Paul, is, he said, hey, hey, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I even know who that and is. They're watching. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the, uh, the first three books uh, follow the life of one person. And I, I did draw on my experience in dealing with the Middle East. And uh, as you well know, uh, in Sharia law, there is something called a queso. And basically, it's an eye for an eye law. Yeah. So that uh, anybody who is charged with a crime the victim can demand an eye for an eye punishment, that type of thing. I found that pretty bizarre and did a lot of reading about it. And, uh, have, of course, studied uh, quite a bit about the uh, Sharia law. And uh, so I wrote that into the book. It's a little difficult for the normal reader when it starts because I wrote in a uh, torture and punishment type of situation. And the interesting point about it is I, I really never ever worried about someone of the Muslim faith reading it and, and being upset because I, first of all, I, I maintained respect. Mm -hmm. and second of all, I didn't tell, I didn't use any situation which couldn't have happened. That's like saying the Saudis don't cut off heads for execu executions. Of course they do. And uh, so I used facts and turned mm -hmm. them into a novel. Yeah, embellishing them and probably wouldn't win any friends in certain areas over there. We won't mention Iraq. Uh, but uh, my second book is called Escape from Iraq. But uh, it, it is interesting, and in, or not Iraq, Iran. The, uh, but so I wrote those into the first three books and I think I had the most fun with the third one because I made my protagonist, my young lady, Danny, Danielle, I elected her president, sort of. And the third novel is called Madam President. And uh, it was fun. I enjoyed that. And, and I like to say that it really is pretty much, ah, there you go. Uh, how do you like that flag? Uh, <laughs> maybe that's a more appropriate flag to be flying o over the White House <laughs> last year. Instead of I, lo I love the flag. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, she really, basically, I wrote things how I wish they could have happened as mm -hmm. opposed to how they really did happen. And uh, so I did a pretty good job with it. A lot of people have said that I should have been a presidential speech writer, but it, oh. uh, it came out pretty good. Now I, I, so the, of the three in the Danielle series, uh, Madam President was the, uh, my favorite, I think. And then uh, I had an idea. I, what if Danielle had occurred in uh, 2000 years ago, what would have happened? So I wrote the eunuch and uh, her Roman general. And I, I, I've i always fancied myself as quite the historian. So I, I wrote factually as, as it might've occurred in Rome 
uh, in the first two centuries uh, of the post uh, crucifixion era. Mm. And uh, I, I like that book too. I really, really enjoyed getting into the history and I had fun with it at the end. If you read it at the end, I tell you, make sure you, the book's over, but make sure you read what's coming on. And then I proceeded to tell them everything in the book that really happened, what wasn't made up. And the, I'll tell you, the scariest things in the book were the truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I the believe things it. I made up were fine, but the, mm -hmm. the really scary things that happened were, were real. And uh, so that was good. So all four books are available on uh, Amazon. And uh, if you How can they find them? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. If you just uh, do a search on my name is probably the easiest way. Tom Pichy with an E. Miss uh, Hajir who keeps yeah. the last E off. P-E-A-S-H-E-Y. <laughs> uh, all of the books and even a few of the ones that I... Uh, helped with like Hajir's and a couple others that I, I edited and was so involved with the author that they gave me uh, credit. And uh, those books will all pop up, but, but you can see them. They're not expensive. If you're mm -hmm. used to reading online and on a, on a uh, Kindle, then, uh, uh, you know, uh, I know mine are uh, just a, a few dollars uh, to, to down, download them and, and you have them forever. And uh, they work very well, and they're easy to read that way. So, and I know he, you told me when we were doing the book, you, you and somebody else, they said, well, this is your memoir. It should only have your name, and you can give credit to me somewhere at the end. And I said, no, it is my memoir, but I want your name there because you did, uh, you brought everything out and so everybody who thinks i'm egotistical this is very true <laughs> i did not want my name on the cover or i did not want my name on the cover and she insisted yes so, <laughs> yes because yes. somebody said well it's, it's a memoir we run out of time there's one thing you haven't told them the which is in the book oh yes 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 and uh we just finished a uh a campaign for hack or a fundraiser for hack where every dollar that comes to the book it goes to it, it went to hack in a specific period of time but throughout the whole sale there is nothing that actually come to us uh beside you know they take what a couple dollars to amazon to process uh every dollar that comes from that book it goes to two things uh uh hse second chance uh, it's a scholarship and it's focused on single moms or single parents who are going through domestic violence. And the second goes to domestic violence survivors. So helping with the coalition, uh, you know, the service for violence in general and domestic violence especially. And Tom wanted to say that, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I'm just honored to have my name and your name together. I don't care how the proper... Um, memoir should sound like or look like but you can't get rid of me that easy buddy <laughs> <laughs> so heather i yeah. know we're running out of time um, mm -hmm. yeah after... i did want to let you, i didn't want to let you leave without doing our lightning round at the end yes. we're going to hit you with a couple questions back to back just tell us what your um first reaction is and these are all tailored specifically to you so <laughs> Here we go. What is one book that you think we should all read? Oh, my goodness. Well, wow, that's easy. How'd you hear? Oh, come on. I knew <laughs> you were going to say that. <laughs> I did not know you were going to say that, but that's a good answer. <laughs> um, who's someone that inspires you? Author, musician, anything? Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, musician, Wynn Marcellus. But... Uh, uh, Here's one that no one would know about. A book entitled God Bless the Child by a transgender woman named Katie Leon, who unfortunately died a number of years ago at the age of 41. And this is uh, this book is a wow moment, a lot of tears. And 
really shows the tragedy that can happen to a child. And that 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 had a huge impact on me. And yes, I edited it. I was gonna ask my next question. Okay, good. So you're you have traveled um, extensively across the globe. So what has been your favorite, most surprising place that you visited? Okay, you're gonna love this. Everybody should see Paris. Mm. Once. Shout out to Deb. <laughs> if you see the whole place once, you probably won't have to go back again. Mm -hmm. But do most of your touring early, early, early at sunup or late, late, late at night. Because the people, they really do stink and they're not friendly. The rest <laughs> of France is fine. But the Parisians, they're kind of tough to deal with. <laughs> okay. okay. I always said the best people I met in Paris were the German tourists. <laughs> <laughs> Next. So your home base is in upstate New York in Rochester. So if we were to come and visit you, what is something we can't leave without seeing or meal? What's good about Rochester? Okay, two things. Mm -hmm. To see Rochester Upper Falls. We actually have a mini Niagara Falls right in downtown Rochester, and people live here all their life and have never seen it. The second, because a gorge goes right through the middle of town. Mm -hmm. The second thing would be food. Oh, gotta be a garbage plate. Nick Tahoe's garbage plate. Don't ask, but it really is a lot easier to appreciate. I thought I didn't hear you right, but on a Sunday morning and you've been out drinking. Uh, okay, got it. That I actually I didn't that hear you right. You, you <laughs> said Nick what? Nick Tahoe's. Tahoe's. -A -H -O -U. <laughs> That's, That's the best great. answer we've had to that question. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, what's some advice you would give to someone who maybe has an idea that they think is good, but either they feel like they have writer's block or they're not quite sure where to start? How do they actually start to become an author, a writer? Okay. There are two different methods that I've seen that are, that are successful. Some mm -hmm. people are so regimented in their thought that they have to have an outline. They put down a whole outline and they know where they're going from point A and they know where they're going to end at point Z. Personally, I don't do it that way. Cool. I have an idea. I have a thought that, that is a, a protagonist. And then I just sat and write. And I can be completely honest with you, there were nights when I got all done and went, holy crap, did I do that? <laughs> you know, and I, 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 I would change directions or come up with something out of the blue that, 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 that completely colored the protagonist differently. And uh, that's how I do it. So there's two different methods. They can both work and they depend on your personality. You know, if you're so regimented that you love mathematics, you probably want to put down all the things you want to hit in order and then do it that way. But uh, if you really want to write a novel or a story of your life or whatever and, and have it be more emotional, then write with emotion. Let, let the moment uh, be your guide. Beautiful. And you know what? I feel a mixture of all of that whenever I read Hajir's book with you, sure. for sure. So our um, last thing that we always say is please keep us in mind. Please let us know if you ever want to come back. You have a standing invitation anytime. We know you're busy. Uh, you're definitely going to be in our thoughts on Wednesday. Let us know how that goes. But please just know that you have an invitation to come back anytime. Absolutely. And we will definitely come back because we are not even halfway of your amazing journey. Right. And I know there is a lot, a lot to share. So mm -hmm. this is um, not just an open invitation, but actually a request. <laughs> once, <laughs> once you feel up to it, you let us know and we will do this again. But I want you to just sum up, like, you know, if someone just joining us, uh, what do you want them to know about you? And, you know, just maybe a few last words before we end the show. Okay. Again, get vaccinated, take control of your own health, make sure that you, anything you've let go for the last 14, 15 months, it's taken care of. And uh, then maybe you'll be fortunate enough to live as long as I have and uh, be looking at your 75th birthday coming up soon. <laughs> but uh, it's been a good life, I have no complaints. 
and uh, got three wonderful kids and six grandkids. And I just hope I'm around for a long time to see where they go from here. And we definitely hope so too. Thank you, my dear. All right. So I uh, love the pictures. What, what, what is that's me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going through, you know, I have to say this, I know we're like one minute over, but I was going through all your, your baby pictures and, and all the pictures out there. I'm like, oh my God, he's just the most adorable <laughs> child. And I had so much trouble choosing because our music, like the intro music is 50 seconds and, and you know, to cram all of this, it was I just chose randomly, so I apologize if I didn't cover all your pictures, but I promise we will do the rest next time when we talk to you. And wish you the best. Good luck with your surgery. And we will be following you and we'll be updating everyone on your health and progress and all of that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Beautiful young women. My delight to work with you. Thank <laughs> you.